This is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. I have another exciting episode for you today. I'm out here in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is the desert, or it was a desert before all the people moved in, started building houses and casinos and all kinds of crazy stuff. Anyways, we're here today to transform the desert and make some raised beds in the backyard of a standard residential house. Now here in Las Vegas, they have watering restrictions and actually they pay you to take out your lawn so you could get desert landscaping and desert landscaping looks like some of the landscaping behind me just a lot of rocks with barely any greens or barely anything growing but you know what you can grow food out here and there are places that are doing it and i have a whole bunch of videos on youtube already showing you know my research because i knew this project was going to be coming pretty soon so what i'm doing in this episode is i'm going to show you guys how to start with a backyard that's basically an abandoned backyard and take it and get some raised beds up and growing put some irrigation in and grow some food here in Las Vegas, Nevada. So the first step is to find out what materials are available in the local area to build the raised beds. Now, you, you know, people in this area could use blocks, concrete cinder blocks, you could pour some concrete, you could use wood, you could use plastic, and you know, you could like mound up dirt, a whole bunch of different things you could use. But I think one of the project goals is to make it look nice, presentable, and neat and orderly, and also basically grow a lot of food. So uh, we're gonna first go around to some of the different stores in the area, including nurseries and big box stores, to see what kind of raised bed material uh, they'll have and also find out the soil. Because if you're gonna invest in growing vegetables at your house in Las Vegas, let me tell you the first thing. You wanna put like 90% of your money into the soil and 10% for the rest of the project. The soil here is absolutely terrible. It's like sandy, not really too rich. So you pretty much need to bring in soil to grow in. So first, we also have to find out the best source of soil at a you know economical, good cost, but also organic as well. So let's check out this backyard and see what we have to work with. So the goal is to you know get growing and convert this whole backyard to a raised bed growing area, or you know growing some kind of food back here, whether they're fruit trees or raised beds and vegetables and looks like there's a big overhang thing to work with or to tear down but there's definitely a lots of uh, space here where raised beds can be put there's just these uh, brick walls you could probably screw into the brick walls to trellis up it and there's an alleyway down there the compost bin and some uh, trash to get rid of pre-existing uh, date palm and a stump so lots of stuff to work with so next I'm gonna start measuring out get a schematic make a plan make a map we're here in the garden center inside Home Depot and a question I get a lot is John what kind of soil are you gonna use well since I'm here in Las Vegas and working on this project I don't have Sonoma compost so uh, we're gonna check out Home Depot we're also gonna send out check out some local garden centers to see what I'm gonna use so let's take a look at what they have here at Home Depot and what I would select if I'm going to use the stuff they have here. So first I'll walk by everything and see what they got. I mean, of course, they got all kinds of miracle Grow stuff. And, you know, if it doesn't even say organic on the package, guess what? I'm just walking right by it. Now this stuff looked pretty good. 1.5 cubic foot Kellogg Patio Plus. It does say 100% natural, organic-based, dual-purpose garden soil. But, uh, you know, let's uh, keep going, see if there's something better. So this is uh, 1.5 cubic feet for $4.97. That is kind of expensive. So uh, once again, I'm looking for organic and cost uh, effective uh, or cheap. <laughs> Here's another one, uh, miracle Grow 1.5 cubic foot organic choice garden soil, $6.97. Um, you know, that could be a contender, but $6.97, 1.5 cubic feet, that gets kind of pricey. Let's keep on going. Here's some Miracle Grow non-organic garden soil, 477. Pass it right up. But here's one I like a lot. This one's a uh, Kellogg garden soil, all natural, uh, three cubic feet. And you can see here, if it has the Omri listed, that means it can be used in organic production. Has been certified good and true organic. I mean, they can use organic on the label, and it might not be really organic. But when you see the Omri, then you know it's definitely good stuff. So it uh, looks like right now it's on sale for $6.87 for three cubic feet. Definitely a good deal. 
Uh, let's take a look at what's in there and I always encourage you to read the label just like if you are still eating foods uh, you know with ingredients uh, on packages read the label and know what you're eating you want to know what you're putting in your garden so here the ingredients are composted forest hummus compost composted chicken manure worm castings kelp meal and bad guano with oyster and dolomite and lime as pH adjusters so to me that sounds like a pretty good mix I like the bad guano and the uh, kelp meal definitely good and once again it's Omri and it's only six dollars and eighty seven cents uh, let's continue down and see if there's anything else that I'd want to consider alright nothing else at that good of a price range here's another Kellogg's product this one's a Kellogg's enriching soil and this one's 787 so it's a dollar more three cubic feet once again and it's Omri listed uh, let's see if we look at the uh, ingredients on this one looks like it's pretty much the same thing forest hummus compost composted chicken manure worm castings kelp meal back guano gypsum with oyster and dolomites so I can think the addi addition is the gypsum but once again this is a dollar more uh, per three cubic feet adds 33 cents a cubic foot I'm all about price conscious and the other one says for vegetables and this one doesn't necessarily say for vegetables on it so that's another thing if you are growing vegetables you want to look for something in some cases that say vegetables rather than not although this stuff would definitely work but I'm not going to go with it uh, let's continue down and see if there's anything else that I might want to use so uh, here's another option here this one is actually uh, nature's way topsoil and it says on there once again a natural organic product and uh, let's see this one's two dollars and sixty two for one cubic foot and then finally they have the uh, earth grow garden soil now the garden soil is two dollars and forty seven cents one cubic foot now I wouldn't necessarily recommend just using a uh, garden soil I'd encourage you to get a compost instead of a topsoil or a garden soil generally I believe the compost has more nutrition than the than the topsoils so I think the best deal here at the Home Depot once again is that Kellogg's 686 for three cubic feet that's definitely the best deal so if I choose to get it here at Home Depot that's what I'm gonna get now we're outside the local Lowe's and we're gonna check out once again the soil to go in the raised beds and you know this might look like a lot of work but you could call them and maybe get incorrect information and not see what's going on and what the best thing to use is and all the prices so going to the store I think is definitely the best thing to do to flip over the bag, read what's in there, and check out all the prices. So let's go inside Lowe's and check it out. So now we're inside Lowe's and we're going to check out the soil here and compare it against Home Depot for the price and to see what varieties they have. Once again they got the uh, Kellogg's Enrich, uh, the Omri, so, but it's uh, $8.15 here, definitely more expensive. And they got this other uh, Enrich here. And uh, once again, that one's $10.12. So that's several dollars more than the Home Depot. Uh, let's continue on. Looks like they got similar stuff with the Miracle Grow and the potting soil and the potting mix. Let's uh, continue down and see if there's going to be anything else a little bit different. Aha, uh -huh. they got the uh, square foot gardening soil, but I'm not seeing that. Let's see if we could find that one. Here's the uh, organic choice garden soil, 1.5, 6.97. It's kind of expensive. Stay green flower and vegetable, uh, not organic. So I'm not seeing anything else here at Lowe's. So uh, we're going to go to the next place and uh, see if there's anything better than what we found at the Home Depot. So we're here outside the local Walmart and we're going to check out our options. Now I'm not a big super huge fan of Walmart but you know some of you guys and girls may live in parts of the country where there's no other hardware stores but you got a Walmart nearby so we're going to check the Walmart see what they have here see what's good and check out the prices because I might end up getting all my stuff to fill my raised beds at the Walmart but you never know until you check it out so we're here inside the Walmart Garden Center and let's take a look at some of the options they have here they have a 100% organic blend 5 includes, includes 5 of the following organic ingredients spagum peat, reed, sedge peat, forest products, compost, compost manure, topsoil, organic byproducts that's a 278 1 cubic foot 
Let's see, I would maybe consider that. Another one they have is this uh, garden compost here. This is a one cubic foot once again. Basically it says it's uh, composted wood finds and sand. So actually, you know, I like a mixed compost that has more than just wood finds and sand. That's kind of a joke to me. Uh, let's see, we don't want to get a potting mix because we're not necessarily potting things up. Although you could get that. It's 1098, really expensive. I guess the last uh, option here uh, is down over here. It's this uh, organic choice miracle Grow stuff. And actually it's quite expensive. $4.48 for a one cubic foot of garden soil. So, I mean, if this is all you got is a Walmart, actually this organic choice garden soil is probably, uh, you know, what I'd recommend. But I encourage you to go a little bit further and try to find a Lowe's or a Home Depot. I think they got much better selection than Walmart. So we're here in Walmart and they got an amazing deal on some raised bed kits. So let's check it out. Here it is, stuck in a corner. Raised bed garden kit round. There it is. That's like 48 inch diameter, eight inches high. Holds 8.24 cubic foot of soil. It's definitely good. I mean, it's it's round instead of square. But here's the kicker. Let's check it out. Kicker is the price. Look at that. Ten dollars. Normally 19.97. So that's half off. So that's definitely going to be really cool. You know raised bed for ten dollars in the round it'll look more stylish although it's not as space efficient so now we're outside star nursery it's a local nursery here in las vegas nevada now i encourage you to always check your local nurseries as well as the big box store to see how and where you can get the best deal on the organic compost and other things you're going to fill your raised beds so this is like the research stage so before you buy anything hopefully you do some research on the product to see if it's good, if it's not good. So I'm basically here to check out the different products, compare the prices, and also compare what's in them so that I can get the best stuff to go in my raised beds because you know what? Your success or failure is all in the soil. I mean, primarily in the soil. Yes, your plants play a small part in watering, but you know what? Your soil could do you right or do you wrong. So it's very important to take some time to research and get the best stuff possible. So uh, let's come inside Star Nursery and check it out. So here's their bag product here at uh, Star Nursery. They got some uh, Red Star Humus Grow. It says uh, nature's all organic mulching material. It's uh, $4.99 for two cubic feet. And here's some uh, all-purpose potting soil. We don't want that necessarily. And uh, here's some stuff, uh, Pay Dirt Premium Planting and Mulch, $6.99. So that doesn't look like it uh, either. It's organic. Uh, 6 dollars for two cubic feet. Oh, and they also have inside uh, bulk organic compost that didn't look finished for me. And that was uh, like $29.50 cubic yard. And they got these cool sacks here. That's really cool. I wish they had big sacks like this at compost. That'd be actually perfect. So we're here in Las Vegas outside the Plant World Nursery. We're at Charleston. Huge street. And actually, this is one of the biggest nurseries in Las Vegas so hopefully they're gonna have the largest selection and some good options for me to consider to fill up my raised bed so uh, let's come inside and check it out so let's go ahead and walk into plant nursery and see what kind of compost and things they sell to fill the raised beds uh, first when you walk in you'll see this uh, display right here Uh, this display basically shows all their decorative rock, planters mix, topsoil, mulch, sand, and gravel they sell in bulk. So you could order any of these basically in bulk by the yard. And uh, let's take a look. Here is the uh, Plant World Organic Topsoil 2850 a yard. Uh, they ha you got to get this stuff delivered. Uh, they don't sell it here. Here's a tomato lady mix, $48 a yard. This stuff, actually, you can either get it delivered for 48 a yard if you want to buy it here. It's $60 for a cubic yard, so it's a little bit more, but it's in a big bag. So we're going to go ahead, look at those next. All the other stuff here just doesn't look good. Like this compost here, to me, this compost looks more like a mulch instead of a compost. I mean, if it's compost, it's definitely not finished. There's too much debris in there to be grown in, in my opinion. All right, so let's go around the side of the building to check out the bulk tomato lady mix. So we're here inside Plant World, and this is actually one nice nursery. They have lots of plants. 
uh, not too many vegetables, but some fruit trees, but even more cool. They got like birds you could check out and actually they're out of the cage. Obviously you don't want to stick your fingers up there. It's almost like a little uh, zoo and <laughs> nursery all in one. Let's go check out the uh, compost in bulk next. So here at Plant World, you could actually buy the Tomato Lady Organic Mix. Now that's not certified, but it has organic in the title. Comes in these big uh, containers like we saw a little bit earlier. But this is actually the compost. So let's check it out. Uh, you saw actually uh, just in the sign we just saw it was $48 per cubic yard if you buy it for delivery. But once again, there's a $100 delivery charge. And if you buy it like this, instead of 48, it goes up to $60 one cubic yard. So a cubic yard is uh, three feet by three feet by three feet. So they have these guys here, and uh, basically you need to bring a truck here. They'll load that up with a forklift in the back of your truck. Then you get to unload it at home. So uh, that's definitely a good option for me to consider, although I actually don't have the use of a truck, so that would be a problem. Plus, uh, some people say that the Tomato Lady product, uh, you know, it's a trade secret what's in there. You know, there may be sewage sludge in there, or biosolids. But it's proven that it works here in Las Vegas. So it's definitely up to you and your decision if you want to use this kind of stuff. So uh, I'm glad that I've learned this and that this is an option, but I'm going to continue to uh, check my other options. So next, let's take a look at some of the bag product that they sell here at Plant World. So we're here inside Plant World. Let's check out the bag product that they sell. So here it is right here. Looks like they got a couple different kinds. They got 100% natural and organic happy frog. Looks like that's $17.98 for three cubic feet. That's definitely good stuff, but that's expensive stuff. So uh, let's continue on. Let's take out this uh, soil building compost, three cubic feet for $10.99. And uh, that, that stuff looks pretty good. Uh, it contains uh, mycorrhizae, forest hummus, chick manure, worm castings, back on gypsum, kelp meal, oyster shells, dolomite, lime, mycorrhizae. So that's actually similar to the stuff at Home Depot that is OMRI certified. This one is not. Here's yet another option. This one's called the Harvest Supreme, two cubic foot for $8.99. And this is uh, basically fir bark, forest hummus, rice hulls, chick manure, worm castings, back guano, kelp meal, oyster shell, lime, and mycorrhiza. So that's actually similar to the soil building compost, but a little bit more expensive at 450 cubic foot. Of course, if you're doing the uh, square foot gardening like I am, they got the uh, Mel's Mix. Here it is. There's Mel Bartholomew, inventor of the square foot gardening. So I'd probably recommend this stuff. Grow well square foot gardening soil, 1288 for two cubic foot. That's actually quite expensive. Let's take a look at what's in there and see if we can make it ourselves. So it's one third peat moss or core, one third vermiculite, and one third blended compost. So I think the cheapest option for me is to make my mixture myself. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and buy some of those items and mix it myself at home. So I'm here at Home Depot, figured out the one I'm gonna get, it's this guy, the Kellogg's All Natural Garden Soil. And we're gonna go ahead and load this up on the cart and uh, get a bunch of these and uh, check out, bring them home. <laughs> Definitely good weight lifting. For about 50 pounds each. Exercise while you garden. All loaded up, let's check out. So we're back from shopping. We got all the supplies we'll need to fill the raised beds and also all the supplies to build the raised bed. So it's gonna be a really easy build out in this project. First, I'm gonna go over all the different products by name really quick, then we'll do close-ups on them. We got the garden soil here, all natural, OMRI certified. We got the neutral mulch here, some more compost. We got the vermiculite. We also got the uh, coconut core. We also got next to that, we got the uh, Gaia green glacial rock dust. Also, we have the azomite, so two different kinds of rock dust. Also, we got some organic fertilizer, and also we got the raised beds. Let's go ahead, uh, pick up the camera, and show you and talk about each one of the products that I got to fill the raised beds and why. So let's go over these products one by one. Uh, as it says on the Mel's mix that you saw a little bit earlier, the mixture is one-third compost, one-third vermiculite, and one-third peat or coconut core. 
So this is the first item we got here. This is the compost item. This is garden soil, all natural. Bigger, brighter flowers and vegetables. And once again, it's Omri listed. And basically, once again, what's in here, in case you can't get this, you know, you want to get something like this. Composted forest hummus, compost, composted chick manure, worm castings, kelp meal, and backwater with oyster and dolomite lime as pH adjusters. So well, once again, this is going to make up one third of our mixture that we're going to make. I might put a little bit more than a third of the mixture in there. Uh, next, also we got the Nutra Mulch all-purpose compost. Uh, turns dirt into soil, organic soil conditioner, and uh, weed-free sterilized and screen. Uh, this is basically turkey manure and wood chips uh, composted. So the Nutra Mulch all-purpose compost is also going to be part of the one-third of compost. The next one-third is going to be the vermiculite. So once again, the vermiculite is Omri listed and uh, vermiculite certified asbestos free. Now the main reason for the vermiculite, especially here in Las Vegas, is the water holding capacity. Uh, that's going to hold the water and keep it in the soil instead of letting it drain down. So that's actually really important. What's next is about at least as important, if not more important than the vermiculite. This stuff is called Beets Peat. This is by uh, Plant Best. And what this is, is uh, instead of using peat moss, peat moss is a non-renewable resource. They're basically harvesting... Uh, peat bogs and when it's gone it'll be gone because it's really not it's taken thousands of years to make the peat bogs but coconuts on the other hand a coconut tree can produce like a hundred to a hundred and twenty nuts per year and they have all the nuts they eat the food inside the coconut you know the water which is all the rage now coconut water instead of Gatorade for your electrolytes definitely good on a nice hot day when you're taking a break from gardening but they have as a byproduct of the coconut industry all the coconut core or the coconut shells not the actual shells but the hair that surrounds the shell and that's the coconut fiber and that's what's in this beets peat it's just pretty much coconut fiber and uh, let's see it says absorbs and retains more water than peat moss improves aeration and drainage adds organic matter to any soil pH neutral and uh, there you go check this out this is just one little small brick here this brick here really small you literally just add water and uh, it expands so look it says one bag of beets peat is equivalent to three cubic foot of peat moss so not only is it easier to ship easier to handle it's gonna basically be one huge bag of peat moss alternative plus it's more sustainable so you can't beat that once again this product is called beets peat next product here of course you know I'm a big advocate of rock dust so every garden I put in they gotta use some rock dust. So here we go. Got the Gaia Green Glacier Rock Dust, uh, one fifty-pound bag. Of course, next to it we got the Azomite. Uh, once again, Azomite.com for more information. And uh, the Azomite is Omri listed as well. Next, we got this uh, fertilizer here, Kellogg's Organic Fertilizer. So this is derived from all natural sources. Uh, basically, the reason why I got this, it contains the. Uh, beneficial soil microbes and mycorrhiza so we don't have any uh, individual mycorrhiza this time but we got the this fertilizer that contains a mycorrhiza in it as well as also has some kelp meal in there so that's the mixture that we're gonna put in the raised beds basically we're gonna put the uh, compost in there followed by the vermiculite and beets peat and a little bit of the Gaia green and the organic fertilizer then of course we also need to build the raised beds we got these uh, raised garden kits and uh, we're gonna try a few of these kits to see how they last uh, I did do some further research on Amazon and some of the people that bought these said they didn't do too well and cracked and broke after like one season so a uh, minimal investment to have some raised beds you know once again ten dollars if it lasts great and if not then you know we'll try something else this is from the uh, you know smart pot company if you saw my other episode at the uh, show at the uh, trade show the garden show here it is you can see a little tag it says the original smart pot smartpots.com this product's not yet available but you can see here this is a 4x4 four four bed and I like this because actually this is 12 inches high and this is actually going to be even simpler construction 
than these raised bed garden kits over there. So another aspect you want to pay attention to when planting your garden is simply this. Uh, you know, go out at several times during the day and see where the shade is cast. You know, if shade is cast, that might be a good thing because you may be creating microclimates or if plants don't like too much sun or to get too hot, that might be good. So we can see here against the wall area, there's a nice shadow as well as in this area on the side of the uh, overhang thing, there's some shading as well as in this part of the yard here near the house, there's some uh, trees that are actually shading the ground. But once again, you know the trees, you can trim those back to prevent some of the shading. If we walk to the other side of the house, looks like there's some sh a little bit of shading underneath this uh, date tree, or date palm. And of course, over in this side of the yard too, there's some uh, shading from the big overhang. But at this point in the day, which is uh, earlier in the morning, looks like this side of the yard actually gets the, the most and fullest sun. So if you want to grow things that like a really full sun, this is the side where it should all happen. So the next step is to basically clear out all this extra brush. It's just weeds grown up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna weed whack, rake up all this stuff, get basically down to the bare dirt. happens <laughs> so we're going to turn this into compost that's going to end up feeding our garden so this is a really important resource to have and the interesting thing is you know if you look underneath this tree it provides a nice shady area which can be also an asset or a benefit because there may be some plants that want a little bit of shade so they don't get too hot but it, but the other thing is that this is a great resource it provides the leaves which is organic matter which will then compost naturally and it's really interesting in most of the yard it looks like sandy desert soil but underneath the trees where the leaves have been dropping it's a lot darker rich soil because the leaves have been dropping over the years and breaking down and composting naturally and enriching the soil so that the tree can continue to grow and also making the soil more fertile so be sure to use your organic resources that you have on site i'm currently filling this up into the uh into the wheelbarrow here and we're going to dump it in a big, huge pile and make a big, huge compost pile so that we can generate more soil that we could use here on site in the raised beds after this is all composted. So I got to get back to work. It's almost lunchtime. I'm going to finish up this side of the uh, yard and then hit, and, uh, hit lunch and then go back to the other side of the yard. So after weed whacking and raking and making a big compost pile, once again, because we want to keep all that organic matter on site to decompose and build more soil so that we can put that compost on our raised beds later, it's all cleared. So we returned the desert to the desert. So this land was laying fallow and just raked it all up and scooped it all out nice and clean. Once again, underneath the trees in that area there, a little bit darker than over in this area because you know organic matter has been decaying and building soil over in that area. So here in the desert, once again, the soil is not very good. So like I said earlier, you wanna spend 90% of your money in the soil that you're growing in. So that's why we had to find some of the best products to use in this area from local stores like you saw a little bit earlier. So the decision was made to clear this land because it was weeds. And if we didn't clear the land with the weeds, we built over the weeds, we'd have a lot of weed seeds that may get into our raised beds and then grow more weeds in our raised beds, which we don't want. Now, I don't always recommend clearing the land and starting with a clean slate, much like a painter that's painting his next masterpiece and he, he starts with a blank canvas. He doesn't start with a Mona Lisa and paint over it, right? You start with a blank canvas. So I like in many cases to start with a blank ca canvas as much as you can. Of course, if you have a lawn, it's not worth picking pickaxing and shoveling up the whole lawn to start fresh. I recommend in that instance, 
you know, to just sheet mulch over the lawn and just build your raised beds and get going. Once again, that is organic matter that will basically decompose and build more soil underneath your raised beds. So each situation may be a little bit different and based on the situation, you need to determine which method is gonna be best for you. So the next step after we got our blank canvas is we need a plan. So a master painter doesn't just say, oh, you know, I got the blank canvas, I got my paint, now what do I paint? No, he has some kind of inspiration and a plan in his head, maybe he has a nude model, <laughs> you know, that he's looking at, oh, he's gonna paint the nude model, he doesn't just start painting cars or something. So we gotta figure out what we're gonna do. We have to have a plan for all our empty space now, our blank canvas. So the next step is we're gonna make a plan about what we're gonna do. And the goal is to maximize the amount of growing that's going on here, like grow in every square inch, except if you have to put in a walkway to walk by. So I guess the next step is we're gonna go inside, fire up that good old computer, go to a website that's gonna really help us to plan out this backyard so that we can grow the most food here. So the next step after you make the plan of what the backyard looks like, this is like that big overhang thing and here's the house and here's the yard, all the different, you know, uh, spacings laid out. Then you're going to take this and then input it into a, uh, basically a program that will help you plan out your garden. And I'm at the website of growveg.com and it gives you a free 30 day trial, which is enough time to get your garden plan planned. And besides doing the planning, you'll also calculate, you know, how much you can plant and all kinds of other stuff that we're not going to get into. I'm just going to simply use it to plan out my garden. Um, you know, it might be worth their annual subscription cost of $25, you know, to uh, even go further with this. But I'm just using it for the planning once again. Uh, they have some uh, videos to show you how to do it, uh, little demonstrations on how to do it. Um, but uh, I've already started the planning so we could go ahead and um, show you what I'm doing here so here's the uh, basically we've inputted the plan we've created little lines to make lines off our area like exactly with the lines on the paper we're just transforming it into a space with graphs so if you did it old-fashioned way you could put this on graph paper one square equals one foot but they make it really easy so uh, basically we have the uh, roofed off patio area the the walkway, the house, and now we have all the space in here to play with. So the raised beds that you saw, I'm putting in our four by four uh, circle. So once you have all your raised beds made, then you're gonna do the uh, raised bed placements in your garden. So you can just basically select the circle by clicking on the lines of the circle. It'll actually put a couple squares, which are drag bars, so you could actually drag your circle bigger, but you don't want to do that because your raised beds, or in this case, the raised beds are going to be four feet circle. You're then going to go ahead and grab the circle by one of the lines and hold down your mouse button, and you'll be able to position this circle. So if you want to position it here, here, wherever you want to do it, then you basically just let, let go, then click the line again, it'll deselect it, it'll put it in place. So the next step is we're just going to create a bunch of circles and then put our circles where we want to put them. So I've had been hard at work and you can see this is the plan I came up with. Now once you get the plan and space everything out accordingly, as you know we have the four foot round raised beds. And uh, basically once you take one item you could just uh, cut it using the cut scissors and then hit the paste button and then just paste a lot of them so you don't have to keep making all of them again really easy so we just pasted a whole bunch out we got them all aligned basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a two foot raised bed along the whole perimeter of the backyard fence and I do that uh, because you can always plant against the uh, you know the fence or the w block wall and grow vertically up it so I always like to use the vertical space against the you know the wall or the fence In this case it's two feet wide originally started at three but then I had to space it out differently to Make sure all my spacing could fit with all my circular raised beds. Uh, once we did that, then we just started placing the beds. And basically, I put uh, about 12 inches in between uh, the different um, raised beds, whether it's the edging or the uh, other circles in between them. So at the closest point, there'll be 12 inches, which is not a whole lot of walking space. So... Uh, but then also because it is a circle, the 12 inches expands as you go out further. 
So what we're going to do now is uh, take our plan, start building some of the raised beds. It's very simple, very easy. And we're going to actually literally lay out the raised beds, the circular raised beds where we want them and kind of see if the 12 inch spacing at the shortest point is going to work or if we're going to change our design to basically make more walking space and make it more walkable friendly. It's a brand new day and we're gonna get started once again. And a plan's very important, much like a ship without a runner. If you don't have a plan, you know, you may not end up knowing where you're going or what you're growing <laughs> or how you're doing it or what's gonna go on. So you might have all this hodgepodge, mismatch garden beds and things that don't look exactly nice. So part of the criteria I'd like to instill within you is to have some things and to grow things that look aesthetically pleasing because that'll make the overall look and feel of the garden just that much better for the person that's visiting or you know uh, coming to see it i mean it's just going to look nicer instead of some you know stuff that you might see at a community garden when there's no or low cost although you can build something nice with no or low cost too but that's a whole nother episode but in any case here's the plan so what was decided in order to maximize space and to maximize the cost of this installation, uh, the material that we're going to use probably <laughs> is going to be these guys, these raised garden bed kits that you saw a little bit earlier. Now, they're only uh, $10, so that's an amazing price for raised garden bed kit. Plus, the other criteria was that, you know, these are very easy to assemble. You could blow them up, I mean, put them up and assemble them very quickly. So how this was designed was to maximize all the space in the backyard you could see the uh, roofed off patio area that we're sitting under right now in the middle here the house is over on this side and basically wherever there's some space there's going to be a four foot round raised bed in that space uh, the next thing is around the edge of the house there's going to be a two foot wide planting bed and that's a very important reason i always like to encourage everybody to grow up any vertical surfaces i mean a vertical surface is a trellis waiting to happen so I mean you could take some screws and screw some lag bolts into the you know wood or concrete and then just pull string and you could have an easy string trellis a nicer one would be a wire uh, trellis just once again pop some uh, lag bolts in there stick them out or some eye bolts and connect wire to them and make some kind of nice design and grow things up your vertical surfaces I mean that is a resource so you know when planning I tried to take as many of these resources into account as possible. So that's why there is a two foot wide bed around the whole edge to grow vertically up the sides. And also along each wall, some walls may get more shade than others. So you should also take into consideration where the sun is and which is south facing. So right now it's a morning and the sun's over in that direction. And you know, certain parts of the yard are gonna get more sun, less shade, than others so that's definitely uh, you know a good thing to know too obviously some plants that like more full sun are fruit bearing plants so some of the crops that could tolerate less sun and maybe a little bit of shade you know you don't want to plant them in full shade are things like herbs and the leafy greens so of course we're gonna plant accordingly when actually planting after we have all the raised beds built so I guess the next step without further ado is that we need to just literally build the beds so uh, I'm ready to do it Let's go ahead and show you how to build one of these easy gardener round raised bed kits. It's really simple. So next we're gonna show you how easy it is to assemble one of these raised bed garden kits. You know, there are kits on the market that are square. These have to be round. These were chosen number one for the price, number two for how easy they are to assemble. So you're gonna go ahead and unzip this package. And you know, I like this packaging. It's not renewable and not recyclable, but it's really cool. So maybe this will get ended up as like popping some holes in the bottom, filling it up with some dirt and having like a planter that looks like this that'll be clear. I don't know, it probably might break down within a year, but until then it might be kind of cool. But this is also really useful, which we'll use in a second, you'll see. So make sure you recycle all your paper always. So uh, what this comes with are some parts. And it's really simple. Uh, you got basically four stakes that are going to go into the ground and also secure the sides of the raised bed. And then you have these little plastic things. These are like things that would hold the, uh, underneath your fender, they would hold like the plastic onto your car. <laughs> but this is also going to hold the raised bed together. Then you have the raised bed and it's banded together with this uh, strap thing. So I guess the first thing to do is undo the strap very carefully. 
And when you do, <laughs> you'll be able to unroll this. But the problem is, <laughs> it's still all rolled up because it's been form fitted in this package for who knows how long, so it's all round. So what you want to do in that case is simply this. You want to take the package back again and uh, take this guy. And what you're simply going to do is you're going to simply... So because it was form-fitted round, you know, it's not really going to make a nice circle. It's, it might be kind of a funky circle. So we're going to take this and we're just going to simply roll that out a little bit and bend this back over on itself gently because you don't want to break it. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> All right, as I struggle to bend this over on itself. So once you got it bent over on itself, once again you're just going to roll it out uh, slowly and carefully. Alright, so now you got it rolled out on itself the reverse way, it's kind of like a spring under tension. You could get some clamps and kind of hold it like that, maybe you like let it hang out like this for like 24 hours or so. But even better, why don't we just use the bag they gave us. We're going to put this back in the bag. And, uh, you know, once again, you're going to want to keep tension on this or it's going to unfurl on you. Once you're putting tension on it, we're going to zip it back up in the bag it came in. All right, that'll show it. Let it hang out in there and uh, wind the other way to get some tension off. So when you unfurl it, it'll be more of a straight kind of long thing versus all coily. And then building it's gonna be much easier. So these guys have been hanging out inside here for a while to basically reverse the uh, coil that they had. We're gonna go ahead and take this out very carefully. This is under extreme pressure. <laughs> so watch out when you take it out. Whoa, <laughs> so there you go. And uh, let's see, once, we get, once again, we're gonna find the two ends where the holes are, and we're just gonna take these little plastic screw things, and we're just gonna put them in the hole very carefully. Once we put them through one hole, we're just gonna find the other line of holes and just line this up. Push it all the way through, once again, very carefully. Very simple, very easy. And there you go. So what I'm doing now is setting the four stakes. There's four of these stakes that are included with the raised bed kit. And you want to put those basically four feet apart. And then hopefully what will happen is this material will form into the circle that it should be. I don't know that it will be that perfect circle as shown on the front cover of the box. But maybe with time it will be. But we'll see. Alright. So we just got this all installed. Got the four stakes in to hold it. It's actually firm and nice in place. It's not gonna move or go anywhere, but basically the stakes are just to keep it in the right position. And uh, you know, I don't know if this over time is gonna form a circle like it should. It's kind of like <clears throat> a weird circle because the, the plastic material just doesn't kind of conform to how it should, so it just doesn't look like the picture in there. Now the choice was made to go with this material for the raised beds because of a few reasons. Number one, they were expensive. Number two, you could build them and put them in really fast. No major construction involved, although you did have to do the stakes and the placement. The other options, you know, may have been like some heavy duty plastic lumber, which some people do use, maybe, and some uh, concrete blocks or pouring some concrete as a raised bed. Now that can get significantly more expensive and actually the concrete blocks, I mean, they're probably really good to work with, but you know, uh, transporting them in your car, if you need a lot of them, uh, you're definitely going to take a bunch of trips because you, you could actually overload your car and that's not a good thing or get them delivered which is going to cause extra, extra expense. So this was the uh, desired material and I'm not entirely sold on it at this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep this one staked in the ground. We're going to set up uh, a few more of these 
unstaked and you know with the soil in there they're pretty much going to stay in place they're not going to really blow away or anything and we're also going to use that big bad bed and uh, you know check that out see how that works so we're going to give it a trial run before we convert the whole backyard over because we convert the whole backyard over then we had major problems with these that's not going to be a good thing if they all started cracking at once but if we put in a, a couple at a time and I often encourage people to start slow by the inch it's a cinch by the yard it's hard start off with one raised bed this year next year maybe make two or three more and continue on till your whole yard is filled up with raised beds and you're growing lots of produce for you your family your neighbors and everybody else in the neighborhood so in any case I got to get back to work we're gonna go ahead and blast a couple more of these up just place them where we need to place them and then we're just literally gonna fill them up and get planting so you can see here we got all our raised beds in place this one's staked, these two are not. We also got this bad boy. This is called the Big Bag Bed by Smart Pot. And uh, you know, check my other videos for the video on setting this up. It was definitely really cool, real easy, cool and fun. This one's all ready to go. So uh, now we have to uh, set up these guys here. So you saw all the stuff that we're gonna put in the beds. Now, if I gotta reiterate anything in this video, spend 90% of your money, especially here in Las Vegas on the soil. This soil right here, this is crap. Nothing really grows. Even the lawns you see here, they roll in sod lawns, they fertilize the hell out of it. I mean, this is really, there's like pretty much no organic matter and it's not too good a soil. So if you do want to grow in this, you got to use all kinds of chems, fertilizers, and other stuff, which I don't recommend. So invest in your soil over all else. So, I mean, these beds were $10, but the soil that's going in the beds costs a lot more than the raised bed itself. So we're gonna use the organic compost, OMRI certified. We got the um, we got the vermiculite, then we got the coconut core, we got some uh, additional compost to put in there, and we're basically gonna fill these up. Each one of these hold, I don't know, about nine cubic feet. So the mixture is simply this. We're gonna pretty much do three cubic feet of coconut core, two cubic feet of the vermiculite, and all the rest compost. Also, we're gonna add in the rock dust. So next, we need to get the coconut core brewing. <laughs> so this is the coconut core. Now the coconut core is much better to use than peat moss. So in Mel Bartholomew's book, The Square Foot Gardening, which I do recommend you read if you haven't, that's, what, that's the system I use for the most part. Square foot gardening is basically growing in nutrient dense, nutrient rich soils, so you can plant crops a lot closer together than they would in a field. Thereby you could yield more, even in something like a small backyard, such as this one. So getting their mixture is really important. So he calls for peat moss or coconut core. And the primary focus and the reason for these guys are to hold the moisture in the ground so the plant's roots can have that moisture it needs. I mean, especially here in Las Vegas, it's really dry and, and no water and dryness is, you know, is oop for your plants. They're not going to make it. So these come compressed. Coconuts, once again, are a renewable resource. The coconut tree, one coconut tree can't put out 100 to 120 nuts a year, the, the water in the coconut is, you know, once again, drank for rich in electrolytes. The food, the meat of the coconuts also uses the food. But then the waste product of that industry of the coconut shell, which they make candles and other decorations, birdhouses out of. But the core, and a lot of core is generated, uh, basically goes into these products. So it's a renewable resource, unlike the peat bogs, which, you know, it takes thousands of years for the peat to accumulate. And once all the peat bogs are gone, guess what? They're gone. They're not coming back. So. I encourage you always to use renewable resources like this. The problem with this guy is that it's really nice because this small brick is three cubic feet, but this is unexpanded, so we need to soak this in water. So next, let's show you how to uh, expand this beets peat coconut core. First, you're gonna wanna just rip the package open using an exacto nice knife. Whenever you're using any tools, be very careful not to cut yourself. That could definitely wreck your day. In any case, once we got this package open, you're gonna see inside the package they give you a couple different bricks and it's a little bit dusty. <laughs> so you can see there's a few bricks. There's four bricks in here. So if you're gonna use, you know, you can just use one at a time, two or all four. We're gonna actually use all four. So it's best to, you know, break this up into small pieces when doing this. It's just gonna work a little bit better and work faster. Really easy to do and give your wrist some exercise. Once again, what we're doing is we're breaking this up. The more surface area that you can create or the more edges on this, 
the faster it's going to absorb water and the faster this is going to be done. If you're totally lazy, you can just pour water over the whole blocks and they will expand, but it's going to take you a little bit longer. And you know what? I don't like wasting any time. <laughs> but you could let this soak and go do other stuff, but I need this to be ready now. All right, I found a better way to break this up than break it with your hands. Use a utility knife. Score it on one side, then score it on the other side. Check it out. Comes right apart, real easy, real simple. Learn as you grow, man, that's my motto. If you're doing something in your garden or whatever you're doing in life, always think of a way as you're doing the task to make it better or to improve yourself. So if you improve every day, you're gonna be a lot better at doing everything in life. And I strive to do that in every area of my life, not just gardening. In any case, all right, there we go. There's all the blocks tore up. Next, you're gonna add about five or six gallons of water. So once again, got a great use of a five gallon bucket used to measure out five gallons of water. If you haven't seen my other videos on using the five gallon bucket, the many uses of a five gallon bucket, in gardening, check it out. It's definitely a fun one, and I loved making that video. Let's go ahead and pour this out. So that's five gallons. Let's go ahead and wet this down a little bit more. All right, we're going to go ahead and let that brew. We'll be back at you in a little bit. All right, old chap, after it's been soaking for a little bit, I'm gonna take the flat shovel once again and just, uh, you know, mix this stuff up, try to break some of this stuff up. The stuff in the bottom is getting, you know, working pretty well, but there's some, still some stuff on top that really needs to get submerged, you know, to totally dissolve and expand. Because, we, you know, if you don't let this expand enough, you're gonna put in blocks. It's not gonna be very effective as a soil medium. You really wanna get it, all this broken up and then mixed into the mixture that are going in the raised beds. So you want to spend some time making sure all this is broken up and also have some patience to let it just kind of act on its own. So I'm going to let this soak while I uh, go ahead and uh, work on some other projects. So our core is pretty well soaked. The next step is we're going to start filling up this first raised bed. You know, once again, Mel recommends one-third vermiculite, one-third coconut core or peat moss and one-third compost. That's three cubic feet of coconut core. We got two cubic feet of vermiculite here. I kind of like coconut core more than vermiculite, so if I put any extra, I'm gonna put in some extra coconut core instead of the vermiculite. Once again, this bed holds almost nine cubic feet. So once again, I like to put the vermiculite in first. It's a bit blowy and dusty. Always best to stand uh, upwind of this stuff so it's not blowing in your face as you're putting it in. This is a OMRI and asbestos free. So once we got that in there, we're going to go ahead and take our coconut core. And if you add too much water, you're going to have to carry extra weight. So you know what? Working in the garden, much better than working at the gym. Next, we're going to dump this in on the top. That way it's going to help to soak up all the vermiculite so it doesn't fly everywhere when you're mixing it. Tap that down. Next step, let's get the shovel, mix it up. So I got that kind of mixed up. The next step is we're going to add the rest of the ingredients. So once again, got to use the rock dust. One pound for one square foot definitely is what's recommended. You can tell I like to measure really well. To me, it's just add liberally <laughs> as much as you can afford. Next, we're going to add this Nutra Mulch all purpose organic compost. Probably got about a square foot in there. Rest of this bag. Into the mixture. So, next, we're going to add the three cubic feet of garden soil. Cut that open. Now you gotta be careful with these edges. You don't wanna like lean tools on it. You don't wanna step on it. You don't wanna drop a bag on it. It'll probably break. That's another reason why I like the big bag bed behind me. I mean, it won't break. <laughs> it's 
Let's go ahead and carefully put that in the middle there. Who needs Jim? All right. All right, there's all that. So this was three cubic feet of compost, about one cubic foot of the other compost, um, two cubic feet of the vermiculite, and three cubic feet of the coconut core. I know it didn't quite look full yet, so we're gonna add a little bit more coconut core and compost to get it all topped off. Then we're gonna mix it up. As you can see, got this bed filled up. Man, it's getting hot here in Vegas. One of the tips if you are a gardener in Vegas, start early, start at sunrise when the sun just gets up. It might be a little bit cool, but definitely in the midday, it gets really hot here in Vegas. So, got to thank my brother for this snazzy, cool jacket he got me. Actually, I like it a lot. It looks pretty sporty to be gardening in. But I'm going to go ahead and take that off. Get back to work. i got to fill up two more raised beds, bust those out. Then we're going to start planting. So, I'm just mixing up the rest of this mixture. And what you want to look for, you know, this is a nice, like, spongy, not even sandy. Sandy's, like, too fine. You want it kind of spongy because that's what's going to hold the water, especially here in the desert. Now, if you live in a wetter climate, you know, you might want it to drain a little bit more so your plants basically don't get root rot. So every climate's going to need a little bit different soil mix, but the one-third, one-third, one-third works pretty well in most places. So besides working with the shovel, I like to work the earth with my bare hands. And don't be afraid to get your gloves dirty. That's why you're wearing them. All right, so we're going to finish off basically getting this raised bed uh, flattened out the soil level then it's time for lunch after lunch we'll be back to plant so now that we got all the raised beds built we're gonna start planting so I have all these plants I got peppers cucumbers eggplants some watermelon some herbs and also some tree collars pretty much we just need to figure out the spacing so once again I'm using square foot gardening spacing some tools that will help you plant are simply this a ruler in inches <laughs> that's one foot spacing Anything smaller than one foot spacing you can measure out. I also have a large yardstick. If you need to do spacing more than 12 inches, this makes it a lot easier. Uh, two tools, like to dig up the soil with either this. In some cases, I'll just use a bulb planter to dig out a nice hole, pop the plant in there, and then, you know, put the soil back in there. So really easy once again. And I want to mention that I am growing plants that I have seen personally grow well, or I know will grow well for the most part in Las Vegas. Now some of them are experimental, but you know what? That's how it goes. You want to play with gardening, have fun, be like a child again. In any case, it's getting a little bit hot out here and it's time to take off all my clothes. Hey, isn't that a song? It's getting hot out here. Take off all your clothes. Anyways, got to take off. Now, you want to always dress appropriately for gardening, you know, and if, especially if the sun's out, you know, don't feel wrong unless you're a girl, I guess, and you're gardening in your front yard to take off your shirt because the sun provides us with free vitamin D and there is a big vitamin D deficiency nowadays in the US and probably other parts of the world too because people are scared of the sun. Now you don't want to get too much sun and get burned but a little bit of sun is only a good thing. So next I'm going to go ahead and lay out my plants and we'll come back at you. We'll show you the layout and then I'm going to get planting. So here's the first bed. This is the herb and perennial bed. So I got the two tree collars on either side. Another tree collars that may or may not make it and some herbs spread out I generally like to get all the spacing and put the pots where they're going to plant. So once I have it all laid out, really easy, just go ahead and dig a hole, pop the plant in there, water really good, and you're all finished. Very simple, very easy. So you can see we got everything planted out. This is the uh, basically the perennial bed, mixed bed, with herbs, tree collards, uh, artichoke, and some herbs. This one is a pepper bed, I think there's about 16 pepper plants, one foot spacing. This is a tomato bed. Land them a little bit closer than I'd like. The bed's a little bit small. Uh, I think we got pretty good spacing on that. Over on this side, we have the eggplant, tomato, and pepper bed, some overflow. And I actually bought way too many plants. The next thing is we need to hook up to the faucet. We're gonna use this Gilmore uh, 9400 uh, water timer hooked up to the faucet. Then we're gonna run our drip irrigation out to it. So next we have to do the watering system. Here's the faucet for the outside. I have a splitter going into four. Nice heavy duty unit. Here's a water timer that we're gonna set up and water the uh, vegetable garden. And uh, first, this is the Gilmore 9400 model. I like this model. Number one, because it has a ball valve. So it's a really durable model. Here's the ball valve right here. You can just actually activate it manually and take your timer off You know, for the winter time or even take this off for the winter time. This is a much more durable than the diaphragm style you know, valves that are available. 
Plus, so we're gonna go ahead and put that back in. And uh, you know, I do recommend you use some brand new alkaline batteries. Now, you know, I like using rechargeable batteries a lot, but the alkaline batteries, you know, and brand new ones too, don't be going cheap and using some old ones. Because this is your water. I mean, to the, your plants, water is life. And if, you're, if it doesn't get water because you're using old batteries or they don't last as long, then that's not a good thing. The lucky thing is this does have a low battery indicator and as soon as it says low battery, then you want to change it. And there it is. You can hear it turning right now. Let's go ahead and put this back together and get it all set up. All right, so once you got the batteries in, it'll tell you on here. It'll ask you to set the time and the date and everything. Now let's see, it's really easy to set. Just use the little buttons. So then you're gonna have to program it. You might need to read the manual. I'm familiar with it, so I'm just gonna program it real quick. So I got it all programmed. We're gonna close the lid. We're gonna screw it on this valve here. Make sure this is sealed tight so it doesn't really leak. All right, so that's how easy it is to get a water timer, set it up, put it on. Now the harder part is get it all connected to the drip irrigation tube. So we have the drip tube right here, but you know we need to convert this faucet over to this drip tube. So we got a couple things here. We got this packet and this packet includes a filter. So I highly encourage you to use a filter when you're using a drip irrigation so your emitters don't get clogged up. Here it is right here. And uh, let's see, we can unscrew that. And there's a filter inside. Now at a later point, I will be upgrading this filter to like a carbon block filter that's gonna remove then more than just the sediment. So for now, we're gonna go ahead and screw that up, make sure it's tight. And then in this kit here, this is a filter, and it includes several different parts. Some of the parts include uh, this, which is required, you shouldn't be doing drip irrigation without it. This is a one-way flow valve. So this is gonna basically take your uh, standard hose pipe connection, spin that on, and these are plastic fittings, so you want them tight but not over tight, and you could bust them out. And then this basically makes sure only the water goes one way, it doesn't go back into your house, because if the irrigation is buried, dirt gets in there, it could actually go in your house, that's not a good thing. One-way valve, very important. So I like to basically make these hand tight, if you use a wrench and tool, then you might over tighten and uh, risk splitting the uh, fittings actually, which is not a good thing. And you don't want it too loose because then you're going to leak. Most of these fittings have like rubber washers like your hose, so they're going to be fairly leak proof. Some of them don't, so this goes to a regular uh, fitting that doesn't have a washer. So we're going to use some Teflon tape to seal up the threads to make sure there's gonna be no leaks. Teflon tape's really easy to use, just put it on and uh, wrap it around a bunch of times. And then it'll basically take up the gaps in the uh, hose pipe so that you don't get any leaks. I like to run that around a whole bunch of times, but not too much. There we go. Then we're gonna go ahead and put this on. Tighten that up. We're gonna give that an extra tight turn with the wrench there. Can't really turn it too well without it. What This is a standard pipe thread. This is converting over the uh, hose uh, style thread to the adapter that's actually going to go to the to the filter we're installing. I think that's fairly, fairly tight there. Ugh. Next we're going to go ahead and install the filter. The filter wanna, you want to make sure it's going the right direction. So the direction for the filter is this direction. Next we're going to go ahead and put some Teflon tape on the uh, filter threads. Now if you're not too handy with this stuff, you know, uh, go to your local home improvement store and ask them for help because you can do it and they can help. <laughs> That's their motto anyways. But often when I go to those big stores, you never find a guy to help you out. And you know, if you do have a question, half the time they can't help you anyways. I'd rather just figure it out myself. It's usually faster, actually, than trying to find a guy and figure it out. But if you truly don't know, then, you know, definitely get some help. This stuff is really simple. It's not rocket science. You know, we're not blasting to the moon. 
we're just putting some Teflon tape onto this fitting. So it's gonna make, oops, make a good uh, connection and not leak too much. And you know, if you don't get enough Teflon tape on there, it does leak a little bit. It's not the end of the world. You could take it apart and do it over or you could just let it leak. Actually plant something below the leak, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That'd be a good idea. Free water. So next, let's go ahead and uh, screw this one in. Once again, we gotta hold this guy while we're doing it. Ugh. All right, it's all getting tighter. I love tight fits. Oh yeah. Ugh. All right, that's pretty darn tight there. All right, I think we're good. Got this face in the right direction. It's all good. So once you got that all set up, the next step's really easy. You're gonna get a piece like this. And uh, this connector basically goes onto this end here and it has a rubber washer in here so it's gonna prevent leaks so you don't need to use Teflon. And uh, we'll just put that in. Screw that in really tight. And on the back of this connector, basically it has the adapter so that you can put this hose right into it. So uh, let's do that next. Now the other thing when you're buying this hose stuff, uh, you know, I recommend using this size. It's either the uh, half inch or five eighths inch tubing. You know, I don't recommend using the quarter inch tubing. It's spaghetti tubing. And that's what they're probably going to recommend you at the uh, hardware store. It just can't flow as much water. And, you know, it's, it's just a pain in the butt. So, you know, spend a little bit more, get the good stuff. I mean, this is serious stuff that landscapers and farmers use. You know, they don't get that cheap stuff. All right, so there's the hose. <laughs> Wanna make sure the hose is clean when you put it on there. And it's really simple, once you get this in, I mean, all you literally do is you take the hose, push it in where it should be, and you wobble it back and forth and it'll go in. So there's different sizes of these hoses and they may be off. You could tell by the different color of the tip. This is a black tip. This is the .700 size and that's the size I like to use. So once again, you just wiggle that in and it goes in and you're ready to go. So now what we're gonna do is roll this out to the raised beds, do some connectors to split it to four different raised beds and um, get our watering set up. Really simple, real easy. You know, the most hardest part is to set the timer up and to get all these adapters. But once again, by this kit I did, it's gonna come with all the stuff you need. Makes it really simple. So now I'm putting in the drip irrigation system. Basically it's just running the pipe, the tube around to each plant. We're just making spirals around each um, a bed. Let's see, this stuff will kink. So if you do wanna do a corner, you need to do a corner, you know, a cut and then put in a corner versus try to like, make it a corner. If you try to make it a corner, it'll kink, then everything will get cut off on water. So luckily, because these raised beds are circular, we're able to go in like concentric, smaller circles or like a Lambreth style loop to the end, and then we'll get all the plants watered. Once again, I mean, this is really simple to use. It's like when you were a kid, you used to drink, you know, uh, you used to put two straws together to like drink the water out of your glass when it's further away from you. Same exact thing. You just use these connectors, waddle them in, get it connected, and once again, we are doing this temporary setup here just to get everything, make sure it has water because we're gonna test these beds to see if they hold up. If they hold up, then we'll probably roll out the rest of the yard with these raised beds. If not, then we'll find another alternative, in which case we'll do the whole irrigation system, you know, a little more professional than this time. This drip pipe is fairly inexpensive. It was $7.50 for 100 feet of it and some connectors are about a dollar each. The uh, filter was about $10 and the timer they run about $40. So, you know, this is fairly inexpensive to set up and everybody should be on a drip system because, you know, it just saves water. And it also, you don't have to, you know, baby your plants. You don't have to worry about watering them because it's gonna come on as much as you need it to. So next we're gonna finish up this. Then I gotta do a pressure test on the line and actually we'll flush the line first. We'll turn it on and make sure all the water comes off at one side. Then we'll put a cap on it. We'll pressure test, make sure there's no leaks. Then and only then will we put the drippers on. So I do want to say that, you know, uh, stakes are your best friend. Basically, we used almost 20 stakes per bed. And that's because the hose, when it comes in a roll, once again, is kind of conform to that shape. So until the sun hits it and it kind of warms up, 
you know, you're going to need a lot of steaks. So, you know, don't go skimpy. Buy the steaks. And later on, you know, in the season after, you know, the pipe conforms to your beds, then you can remove a lot of them and reuse them. But uh, until then, buy your steaks. So what we did was we uh, ran the end so all the water could go through the whole system and purge out any kind of dust, dirt, or debris. That was fine. We then closed it off, turned it on, did a pressure test. I see no leaks, so the next step is we need to put the drip emitters in. Now, putting drip emitters in are very easy. And all you're going to do, we got these drip emitters, and I like the Dig brand. Once again, I have other videos on this with more about specific irrigation. This is kind of like an overview video. You basically get a tool. This is a cheap tool. They have a more expensive tool. But basically, you just pop a hole in the drip tube and push this in. You'll hear a little snap, and uh, you're ready to go. So I got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of plants. Let's see how many... Uh, of packs I use. They come in packs of 100 for the best value. You can also buy them by the pack of 5, 25, I think maybe 52. Once again, this is a dig brand. Uh, you could actually open this uh, one up to clean it. Uh, you know, most of them are sealed units and once they clog up, you got to toss them. But I like this brand because you can open them up. Nothing feels better than a project all finished. Got all the irrigation in, put all the drippers in, pretty much used a little bit over 100 drippers. Put two on some of the tomatoes, one dripper on everything else. We're set up on the timer. The initial timer went off, so I tested it. It's working functionally. Turned itself off. Looks really good. So we got the marigolds planted also to make it look nice and also be functional. And also they're edible, so I really love the marigolds. So how long did all this take? Really, once all the materials were sourced, it really took one day to put it all together and get it all planted out, including the drip irrigation system. Granted, I have done this before, so it might take a little bit longer. Say a good weekend, you could get four raised beds in Plan it all out. Of course, you know, the shopping can take some time too to get all your materials together. That's, we're not counting that right now. In any case, it's really easy to build raised beds. You saw the whole process here in this one video. So hope I've motivated you to show you how easy it is so that you too can grow more food at home. Once again, this is John Kohler with GrowInYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time and keep on growing.